Hi, my name is Jennifer Zallen, and I am a professor at Sloan Kettering Institute and an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And today I'd like to talk to you about building multicellular structures during development. So each one of us is a multicellular animal that contains billions of cells, each with their own intrinsic properties. And these cells have to work together to build the characteristic shapes and features of different animals. So our bodies contain many different kinds of cells, and these cells often have to move some distance from where they're born to where they need to end up in order to carry out their functions in the animal. So in my lab, we're interested in understanding how cells get where they need to go during development and how many cells work together to build uh, functional three-dimensional structures. So one way to think about this problem is to imagine a crowd of people at a busy train station. Each person has somewhere where they're going, but how they get there can be quite complicated. So to get where you're going and navigate through this complex environment, you need to know where you are in space on multiple levels. For example, you need to know where you are relative to the four or five closest people around you, but you also need to take into account the overall flow of the crowds, the push and pull of, um, of crowds of people as they move through the station, as well as know where you are on a map relative to your final destination. And all three levels of information are necessary to take the most efficient path to where you're going. So in my lab, we're interested in understanding how cells navigate as they move through the body during development. And um, to, to, to get to the, the places where, where they need to end up, cells receive spatial information from many different sources. So for example, cells can interact with other cells in their immediate environment. Cells generate forces in order to move, and they in turn are exposed to the forces generated by cells around them. And finally, each cell needs the equivalent of a compass that tells it where it is relative to a global map of the entire animal, shown here, a map of the Drosophila embryo, or the fruit fly embryo. So all three types of information are necessary to build the elaborate structures that are generated during development, as well as to enable the regeneration and the repair of these structures in adult animals. So today I'm going to talk about an organizational problem faced by many animals, which is how to build a body axis that's elongated from head to tail. And um, this is a process that happens in fish, it happens in frogs, and it happened to you or you wouldn't be watching this talk. And during this process, all of these animals need to reorganize an amorphous mass of cells that can be hundreds of cells or more in size into one that's highly elongated along one axis to produce the characteristic elongated shape of the body plan. Now, in my lab, we study this problem in the, the fruit fly Drosophila, shown here on a banana. And um, Drosophila is an excellent system for studying uh, developmental biology. The flies are very easy to grow and work with in the lab. And importantly, the structural changes that build the head to tail body axis happen at the surface of the embryo, where we can directly visualize what the cells are doing by live imaging. Now, it's important to understand this process um, not only because many different types of cells, uh, different types of tissues have to elongate during development, such as the lung, the gut, and the spinal cord, but also if we can understand how cells self-organize to form complex structures during development, we would be that much closer to helping to fix structural defects that arise during human disease. So. Um, this is a picture of the Drosophila embryo undergoing elongation. And the embryo before elongation is shown here at the top. It's about half a millimeter long. And at this stage, the embryo is basically just a single monolayer of cells surrounding a ball of yolk. So all of the cells are located at the surface of the embryo. And the head is to the left, the tail is to the right. And as um, uh, during elongation, this, the, the germ band indicated by the yellow line undergoes a major reorganization in less than one hour to more than double in length along the head to tail axis, and at the same time it shrinks to half its initial height along the perpendicular axis. And because the embryo is uh, encased inside a protective membrane that surrounds the embryo, as it gets longer it's forced to wrap around on itself so that the head ends up next to the tail. Now, Ken Irvine and Eric Wishaus showed that these structural changes um, uh, occur primarily through organized cell movements. So while the embryo as a whole is elongating from left to right in these images, individual cells within the embryo are moving up and down in a coordinated fashion. And this is just shown in these um, the pictures here. And what you can see is that cells that um, 
basically rows of cells intercalate to form fewer, longer rows. So for example, if you look at the cells in this yellow row here, by the end of the process, the yellow cells that were all originally next to each other in a row become separated by neighboring cells from the green and purple rows. So to understand how cells reorganize to get from here to here, Dean Farrell and Ori Weitz in the lab came up with a computer algorithm that can automatically identify and track cells um, in time-lapse movies. And what they found is that individual cells not only navigate um, as, as solitary cells through this tissue, but they um, actually engage in collective cell behaviors that enhance the speed and the efficiency of elongation. So this slide shows the two types of cell rearrangements that contribute to elongation. Each row of cells shows the same group of cells from three time points from a time-lapse movie. And the top uh, panels show this process of local neighbor exchange discovered by Tomala Lequi and colleagues, where a single vertical edge between two cells, shown in red, shrinks to a point and is replaced by a horizontal contact here in yellow between the top and bottom cells that were previously not in contact with each other. In addition, through live imaging of, of, uh, of many cells, we were able to find that these cells also engage in this unexpected um, collective rosette process, where many uh, linked edges, shown here in red, shrink simultaneously leading to the formation of a multicellular rosette structure where as many as 10 cells can come into contact at a single point. And these structures always form and resolve in a strictly directional fashion. So they form through the contraction of vertical edges, and they resolve through the formation of these new horizontal edges, shown here in yellow. And what this does is convert a group of cells that was initially tall and thin into one that's now short and wide. And you can imagine if many cells are doing this throughout the tissue, that this would cause a, a, an overall elongation of the embryo. So to show you what this looks like, this is a movie of axis elongation in a Drosophila embryo where each of these polygons is a cell, and the cells are outlined uh, by the green fluorescent protein tagged to a, a, a membrane marker. And the head is to the left, the tail is to the right, and the cells that we're interested in are in the center. And as the embryo elongates, the cells at the bottom will internalize, but we focus on the cells that remain on the surface, which drive this elongation. And you can tell that the embryo is elongating because cells are flowing to the right out of the field of view as the tail is moving further away from the head. And what's driving this elongation is groups of cells within this tissue are converging along the vertical axis and resolving in the horizontal direction through the formation of these transient multicellular rosette structures where many cells come into contact at a single point. Now these behaviors are reiterated throughout the tissue and are associated with a doubling in the length of the body axis. Now since our discovery of this rosette mechanism for tissue elongation, rosettes have now been shown to be a general mechanism for elongating many different types of tissues invertebrates, including the chick and uh, mouse neural plate, uh, which are structures that have to elongate substantially to form the spinal cord. And these behaviors suggest that there's communication between cells. These cells are not just navigating on their own, but they're communicating with each other to form these groups that are able to rearrange more efficiently than the cells could achieve on their own. And we would now like to understand how these uh, uh, cells generate the forces that allow them to move and rearrange within the sheet and how these movements are spatially organized so that each rearrangement inexorably moves the head further away from the tail. So to identify the molecular basis of these behaviors, we started by looking for molecules that are asymmetrically localized in the plane of the tissue and, um, and correlate with the direction of cell movement and could potentially be generating the forces that move these cells. And this slide shows the first two molecules that we found. So here you're looking at a field of around 30 cells. And in particular, the myosin-2 motor protein, shown here in green, localizes to the, surface, uh, the cortex of cells, but it's not uniform throughout the cortex. It's higher at these vertical edges between cells, creating the impression of vertical lines in this image. Now, the movement of myosin-2 motors along actin filaments generates contractile forces within the cell. And so this suggests that contractile forces that are planar polarized or oriented consistently within the plane of the tissue in this vertical direction could help drive cell rearrangements during elongation. PAR3 has the opposite pattern. It localizes to the horizontal edges of cells. 
where it stabilizes um, adhesion between cells or the ability of cells to stick to each other, and it also excludes myosin, keeping myosin at those vertical edges. So through work from my lab and others, we've now identified more than 10 proteins that are, include both signaling and structural proteins within cells that are required to organize these uh, contractile and adhesive proteins within cells and are necessary for the embryo to elongate. So to look at the dynamics of how these proteins organize during elongation, Sergio Simuis in the lab made uh, movies of embryos where myosin 2 is shown here in green and PAR3 is labeled in red. And time is indicated in minutes and seconds. And at the beginning of this movie, myosin 2 is mainly in the cytoplasm. So these circles you see are exclusion from the nuclei of cells. And PAR3 is present in dots at the newly forming uh, junctions between cells. And what you can see is that as the embryo gets ready to elongate, uh, myosin 2 in green moves from the cytoplasm to the vertical edges of cells, and PAR3 in red becomes restricted to the horizontal edges. And um, what was striking about these movies is that myosin 2 is not just asymmetrically localized within cells, but it often forms these long extended cables that can connect multiple pairs of cells within the tissue. And this suggests that mechanical um, contractile forces aligned across many pairs of cells could um, generate the forces that drive rosette formation and cell rearrangements during elongation. So to test this idea, Rodrigo Fernandez Gonzalez in the lab used laser ablation to cut individual edges between cells in order to measure their mechanical properties. So in this first movie, uh, Rodrigo used the uh, UV laser to cut a single interface between cells that's contracting on its own to drive local neighbor exchange. And you can tell that that edge was under tension because the two vertices attached to the cut edge move apart when that edge is ablated. And the speed and the distance of that retraction is proportional to the amount of tension that was acting on the edge right before he cut it, uh, assuming that viscoelastic properties are uniform throughout the tissue. So this retraction distance is just, over time, is just plotted here in this chart. Now the movie on the right shows what happens when Rodrigo uses the laser to ablate a single edge, but one that's part of a multicellular cable that's um, going to contract to form a rosette. And what you can see is there's a much greater displacement of the two vertices attached to the cut edge as well as the surrounding cell. So these edges and cables are under more tension. And in fact, shown here in this plot, you can see that edges and cables are under uh, twice as much tension as single vertical edges that contract on their own. And both types of vertical edges are under more tension than these horizontal edges in green, which uh, have much less myosin. So these results tell us that mechanical forces are anisotropic within the tissue. They're highest um, in the vertical direction, and, that they're, um, and where they're highest in the sheet is at, in multicellular cables that are forming rosettes. And we've shown that these forces can travel up to tens of microns within the tissue and um, promote uh, cell rearrangement and axis elongation. So we now have a lot of information about the cell interactions that occur during axis elongation, as well as the polarized force generating machinery that actually drives these cell movements. But if we take a step back from thinking about what's going on inside the cells to looking at what's happening throughout the entire tissue, a major unanswered question is what orients these polarities across hundreds of cells so that they all move in the same way to promote tissue elongation. And this suggests that an additional system remains to be discovered that provides a global map that orients these polarities so that the cells all move um, in the same way to move the head further away from the tail. Now, the only clue that we had to the nature of this map came from a study by Ken Irvine and Eric Richthaus over 20 years ago showing that striped patterns of gene expression along the head-to-tail axis are necessary for elongation. So like us, flies have differences in um, cells along the head-to-tail axis. And in flies, these differences take the form of stripes because the body of the fly is segmented. In particular, Eve and Runt are two transcription factors that are expressed in seven stripes along the head-to-tail axis. And this stripe expression pattern is critical for their function in elongation. So embryos fail to elongate normally when either Eve or Runt stripes are missing or when either of these proteins is uniformly expressed throughout the embryo. So these proteins don't just have to be there, but they have to be present in stripes in order for the embryo to elongate. 
And we found that these stripes are not only necessary for elongation, but they're also sufficient to polarize cells. And the evidence for this came from experiments that I did with Eric Wishhouse, where we generated mosaic embryos that have an ectopic source of Eve or Runt protein, shown here in blue. So for example, in this mosaic embryo, a myosin marker is shown in green, and it localizes to mainly to vertical edges of cells in the normal region of this embryo. But when you get to this clone of cells that have ectopic runt protein, you can see that myosin polarity reorients to follow the clone boundary. And similarly, in this embryo that's mosaic, it has an ectopic source of Eve, you can see that myosin polarity in green reorients to follow the boundary of, um, of the Eve clone. So in each case, the orientation of cell polarity is dictated by the juxtaposition of cells that have different levels of Eve or Runt activity. So these results suggest a model where differences in gene expression along the head-to-tail axis of the embryo provide the spatial information that organizes cell movements um, during axis elongation. But I mentioned that Eve and Runt are transcription factors, which means that their job is to localize to the nucleus of cells, bind to DNA, and regulate the expression of other genes. And so because of their role in the nucleus, this model is ultimately unsatisfying. Because what we really want to know are what are the targets of even run that localize to the surface of cells and allow cells to read the spatial cues in their environment that tell cells which way to move. So to identify these targets, Adam Pere, a postdoc in the lab, used RNA sequencing to compare gene expression profiles between embryos where both Eve and Runt were knocked down by RNA interference with water-injected controls. And he was looking for proteins um, that are, are targets of Eve and Runt, they're expressed in stripes, and that localize to the surface of cells where they could directly regulate cell polarity and behavior. So using this approach, Adam identified three transmembrane proteins in the toll receptor family as targets of even runt during axis elongation, toll 2, toll 6, and toll 8. So toll was originally identified in Katherine Anderson's lab in Drosophila, and it's now known to represent a large family of proteins in both vertebrates and invertebrates. And these proteins have a conserved molecular structure, including a single transmembrane domain and a long series of extracellular leucine-rich repeats, as well as conserved sequences in the cytoplasmic domain. Now, these toll family receptors are perhaps best known for their roles in regulating um, uh, the innate immune response to pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, and parasites in the body. And in particular, this slide just illustrates some of the phenotypes of mouse um, mutants that are lacking individual toll family receptors, and these mutants are defective for a subset of immune responses in the animal. And the signaling pathway downstream of these toll-like receptors is very well characterized, with the major output of this pathway being the movement of an NF-kappa B transcription factor shown here in green from the cytoplasm to the nucleus of cells, where it activates the expression of genes involved in the inflammatory response. However, while um, some of the toll family receptors in Drosophila are required for immunity, the functions of most of the members of this family in, in Drosophila were not known. So since um, these genes are expressed in stripes, Adam first wanted to confirm that they really are uh, regulated in some way by Eve and Runt, and that's shown in the images on this slide. So the top row of images show uh, pictures of a wild type or normal embryo. And you can see that toll 2 is expressed in many thin stripes along the head to tail body axis. And this pattern changes to become fewer broader stripes in embryos that are missing Eve or Runt. Now toll 6 and toll 8 are expressed in a slightly different pattern. They're expressed in several broader stripes. And this striped expression is reduced in Eve mutants and is uh, increased and is more in a more uniform pattern in runt mutants. Um, now if you look at the, so these, these toll receptors are expressed um, in, a way, in a stripe pattern that requires even runt activity for their normal pattern. And you can tell that these, these three toll receptors are expressed in slightly different stripe patterns. And putting these patterns together, you get something that looks like a positional code, where nearly every cell expresses a different combination of one, 
two, or three receptors along the head-to-tail uh, axis of the embryo. So the expression patterns of these three toll receptors relative to the segments of the animal are indicated here. And you can see that when you combine these three expression patterns, nearly every cell expresses a different uh, type or uh, concentration of toll, uh, these three receptors, than their Im immediate neighbors to the head or to the tail. And the evidence for this type of positional code comes from types of experiments shown here on the bottom. Uh, so here, Adam did a, uh, looked at the mRNA uh, expression patterns of TOL2 and TOL8. And you can see that um, the bright TOL2 stripes in red are largely complementary to the TOL8 stripes in green. And this image on the right is an image of TOL8 uh, protein fused to a derivative of the green fluorescent protein. And um, you can see that it's also expressed from its uh, endogenous regulatory sequences. And you can see that this TOL8 uh, protein fusion is expressed in stripes and localizes uh, to uh, the membranes of cells. So these three TOL family receptors meet our first two criteria. They're expressed in stripes downstream of even runt, and they localize to the surface of cells where they could be directly involved in sensing spatial information in the environment that determines um, the direction of cell movement. So to ask if these proteins are required for elongation, Adam Perret used genome engineering to generate embryos that are uh, defective for one, two, or three toll family receptors. And what he found is that although you get a reduction in elongation when you remove two receptors, you have to remove all three in order to see a strong defect. So working together with Zach Merman and Dean Farrell in the lab, they made movies of embryos that are missing one, two, or three receptors. And this slide shows a movie of a wild-type uh, embryo on the top and, a, and an embryo that's completely lacking TOL2, 6, and 8, shown here on the bottom. And time is indicated in minutes and seconds relative to the start of elongation. So this movie starts 10 minutes before the embryo is going to elongate. And the cells are color-coded based on uh, the rearrangements that they've gone through. So they'll start off uh, as purple, and then they turn blue as they go through one rearrangement, and then green yellow and red as they go through more and more rearrangements um, within the sheet. And if you focus on the top movie, you can see that the wild type cells are very active. So the cells are turning colors. You see many green cells followed by yellow and then red cells appearing in the tissue. And this is accompanied by elongation. So cells are flowing to the right out of the field of view and the embryo is doubling in length. In contrast, if you look at the bottom movie, the TOL268 triple mutant is much more sluggish. There's many more purple and blue cells remaining late in the process. And as a result, the elongation of the embryo is reduced by 30% in um, these TOL268 triple mutants. So, uh, so these TOL receptors are required for cell movement, and um, fewer movements occur when they're missing. And when we followed the movements that still occur in these mutants, we found that uh, the cells that do arrange in this background um, are moving in a way that's less directional. So for cell rearrangements to produce elongation, the rearrangements have to occur directionally with respect to the head-to-tail axis of the embryo. Otherwise, the cells would just be changing places, and you wouldn't get a net elongation. So all of the rearrangements have to occur through the contraction of vertical edges separating these two cells that were initially in contact and the formation of new horizontal edges between cells that were not previously in contact. And when we plotted the uh, rate of errors in the second step of edge assembly, uh, you can see that in wild-type embryos, these rearrangements occur directionally 90% of the time. In contrast, when we looked at the error rate of edge assembly in embryos missing one or two toll family receptors, what you can see is that the frequency of defects goes up to about 20%. And in embryos missing all three toll receptors, cells rearranged in a way that's not directional uh, a third of the time. So for example, in this schematic, a vertical edge will shrink to a point, and the new edge that forms is uh, also is the same, exact same edge as the edge that was there originally. So even though these cells went through the trouble of going through a cell rearrangement, no net elongation occurs as a result. And the defects in total triple mutants are similar to the defects in Eve and Runt mutants. So these defects in uh, the orientation of cell movement are suggestive of a defect in cell polarity. And in fact, Adam found that these mutants are, um, have defects in the localization of the force-generating machinery within cells. So I mentioned 
earlier that PAR3 protein shown here in magenta is planar polarized. There's a difference between horizontal and vertical edges um, in the plane of this uh, tissue. And you can see that there's more PAR3 at edges that are closer to horizontal and less PAR3 at vertical edges. And PAR3 acts in these horizontal domains to stabilize adhesion between cells and also to uh, restrict myosin so that myosin is at vertical edges. And what you can see from this image is that in toll triple mutants, PAR3 planar polarity is severely disrupted. PAR3 now localizes to edges of a, a, a variety of orientations. So you now see um, many more cells so, uh, with PAR3, um, not just at horizontal edges, but, but at, um, at most or all of the edges of that cell. And uh, Adam sees a similar defect in the localization of myosin II. So this tells us that these, um, these cells are not just moving in the, in the wrong direction, but they actually uh, seem to have completely lost their direction. They don't have the capacity to polarize their force generating machinery in a way that would allow them to move in an organized way. So what I've told you so far is that we have these three toll receptors that are required for cell polarity and, um, and for cell rearrangement during axis elongation. And now if these are the key receptors that link the striped information provided by the even runt striped transcription factors to uh, the organized cell behaviors that establish tissue structure, then um, the key missing experiment is that these proteins should be sufficient to polarize cells, not just required for this process. So for example, I mentioned that expressing an ectopic source of Eve is sufficient to repolarize cells um, in the vicinity. And so we wanted to know, can an ectopic source of a toll receptor have the same effect if these receptors are the critical targets of even run during axis elongation. Specifically, we wanted to know if in a field of cells that's not normally polarized, if you put a, in a stripe of a toll receptor protein, is that enough to polarize these cells? So to address this question, Athea Vichis, a graduate student in the lab, expressed um, the toll proteins in, in stripes in the late embryo at a stage when these cells are not strongly uh, polarized. So you can see in this control stripe, um, shown here in blue, um, does not induce a strong polarity of myosin II in green in this image. But in contrast, in embryos that express toll II um, in, in the stripe, in magenta, you get a strong enrichment of myosin II specifically at the boundary where, um, where uh, Athea induced a difference in toll II expression levels. So this result tells us that the toll receptors are not only required for a polarity, but they're sufficient to induce polarity um, uh, when you introduce a, a local discontinuity or a stripe of toll activity. So if these are the key receptors that um, establish cell polarity in the embryo, this raises the question of what are the ligands that they bind to that allow cells to sense their orientation with respect to the overall axes of the animal. And in the immune system, these cells, uh, the mammalian toll-like receptors, detect foreign molecules in the animal that are uh, presented on um, invasive pathogens. But this is in the embryo in the absence of infection. And so there aren't predicted to be any pathogens present. And so we propose that maybe in this case, these receptors might be detecting receptors expressed on other cells. And for example, if, um, if the toll receptors interact uh, homophilically with other receptors in the same stripe, then interactions between these receptors might recruit PAR3 to horizontal edges of cells. Alternatively, if these receptors interact heterophilically between stripes that, of cells that express different receptors, then interactions between these receptors might locally activate myosin um, and induce these cells to rearrange. Now, the striped expression of these toll receptors suggests that they act as a positional code, and we're starting to decipher this code using studies in cultured cells. And um, these studies, Adam, working together with Chris Fincher in the lab, expressed the toll receptors in um, Drosophila S2R plus cells um, to ask, can these receptors mediate adhesion? And what they found is that it, cells expressing one receptor have a preferential affinity for cells expressing a different receptor, resulting in the formation of these long chains of cells that express alternating toll of family receptors. So this, uh, this type of interaction, along with some other evidence in cultured cells, is consistent with the idea that these receptors can participate in heterophilic interactions. They interact with different members of the same family um, suggesting that they could mediate interactions between neighboring stripes of cells along the head-to-tail axis of the embryo.
So what I've told you about today is that the global map that provides spatial information that orients the movements of hundreds of cells with respect to the head-to-tail body axis of the embryo is provided by three members of a conserved toll receptor family that interact um, heterophilically uh, to mediate interactions between neighboring stripes of cells. And these interactions give cells information about uh, their orientation with respect to the body axes and help to polarize the force generating machinery that propels cell movements within the sheet and um, leads to the, uh, these local uh, and uh, collective cell rearrangements that drive tissue elongation. So these results identify a new function for uh, toll re family receptors in development in addition to their known role in detecting um, in telling the difference between self and non-self in the immune system, these receptors can also tell different types of cells apart uh, in the embryo um, in a mechanism that gives cells uh, spatial cues as, as they uh, move to their final destinations. And we would now like to understand how this code works. How do cells tell the difference between neighboring cells that might express different types of toll receptors or even different levels of the same receptor? And how do these heterophilic interactions between receptors at the cell surface signal to the force generating machinery that drives cell movement? In particular, I mentioned that the major output of toll receptor signaling in the immune system is the activation of NF-kappa B dependent transcription of genes involved in the immune response in the nucleus of cells. But the rapid time scale of axis elongation, combined with these striped patterns and uh, predicted localized interactions between toll receptors, raises the possibility that these receptors might have a, um, a signaling output that doesn't go through the nucleus, but could potentially um, act in a fast-acting way at the cortex of cells um, to result in a, in, a, in a rapid execution of um, uh, spatially guided cell movements. And a better understanding of these novel functions of toll family receptors in Drosophila can provide insight into the mechanisms by which toll-like receptors regulate processes such as tissue regeneration and wound healing in mammals. Now finally, I just wanted to acknowledge the amazing group of people in my lab who did the work that I told you about today. And um, they've made many uh, important uh, discoveries about how cells assemble to form tissues. And I'd like to thank the people whose work that I had time to talk about today, as well as the people whose work I didn't have time to talk about today. And thank you very much for listening.